am Professor Sumita Parmar. I am the principal investigator for the subject of women's studies and today I am going to be presenting to you the first module of paper number two which is on women and literature. The title of the module is A History of Literary Feminism. This module has been written by Professor Asim Siddiqui uh, who is head of the department, uh, Department of English, Aligarh Muslim University. Introduction. The expression literary feminism has two key words, literature and feminism. The term is used interchangeably with feminist literary criticism. As an academic subject, different from countless activi activists fighting discrimination and bias in the real world, fem feminism is an interdisciplinary field which cuts across subject boundaries. Students of history, psychology, sociology, law among others study feminism. However, feminism has an extremely important relationship to literary studies. Since its beginning, the literary dimension of feminism has played a crucial role in shaping the nature of the subject, hence the currency of the expression literary feminism. Literary studies has not been a stable field. How literature is defined and studied and what constitutes the subject matter of literature are questions which have been answered differently in different times. The advent of theory since the 60s has changed the way readers approach works of literature. Earlier, literature was viewed as a universal and timeless artifact. For example, it was generally held that the message in the work of literature, particularly in the works of great writers like Shakespeare and Milton, was addressed to all people in all times to come. But theory focused attention on the implications of race, class and gender in literary studies. And some pertinent questions were asked by feminist critics. They questioned the relevance of the canon. They changed, they charged literature for its sexist bias. They raised the question of the exclusion of women writers in the established canon of literature. Putting gender issues at the very center of their reading and writing, they offered to read literature in a different manner. In other words, a theoretically alert literary feminism was born. Though it is an ongoing project, some important works published in the 60s and the 70s have had a seminal influence on literary feminism. Two dominant aspects of literary feminism are generally emphasized, women as readers and women as writers. Women as readers. Women readers took up the task of reading texts written by male writers, focusing their attention on many of the problematic aspects in them to which male critics were supposedly blind. An example is given by Jonathan Culler, who refers to Michael Henkerd in Hardy's The Mayor of Casterbridge, selling his wife Susan and his baby daughter. This act is likely to affect a male reader and a woman reader differently. Susan, the wife, being represented as a hag, a commodity to be disposed of so that Michael Henkerd can resume his normal life is objectionable and condemnable to a female reader. This image of a suffering wife can fill a woman's heart with horror. A number of critics have quoted this passage in their works to show the insensitivity of a particular kind of criticism. This kind of criticism was considered phallic criticism by Mary Elman. Gradually, a number of works appeared which looked at these negative images of women in works of male writers. In fact, a whole industry of images of women's studies flourished in the academy. Two pioneering studies which influenced images of women include Mary Elman's Thinking About Women and Kate Millett's Sexual 
politics. Myth and archetypal criticism had already talked about some stock images which have appeared in literature like the temptress, the mother and the wise old man. However, Elman identified the traditional femin feminine stereotypes created by men in literature. The usual characteristics included formlessness, passivity, instability, irrationality and materiality. Thus the stereotype of irrish, irrationality means that unlike men who are thought to be rational creatures, women are dubbed as irrational. How often in our day to day lives do we hear that women are guided by their hearts and men by their minds. Elman also spoke against what she called sexual analogy, whereby the emotional and intellectual nature of women is considered equal to their sexual nature. She discussed the treatment given to women's writing in phallic criticism, saying that books by women were treated like men, like women by male critics. There must always be two literatures, like two public toilets, one for men and one for women. Kate Millett's sexual politics was even more influential. In a scathing analysis, she attacked canonical male writers like Norman Mailer, D. H. Lawrence and Henry Miller for perpetuating misogynistic images of women. She revealed that Lawrence celebrates a cult of virility in his fiction. Miller displays women hatred in his work and Mailer shows his anxiety and fear of losing power to women. Like Elman, Millet also highlights the fact that common feature in their work was the division of the strictly masculine and feminine personality. Men and women are identified in literature with certain characteristics. Women with domesticity, childbearing, dependence on men, passivity, ignorance, docility and ineffectuality. Men on the other hand with leadership, ambition, aggression, intelligence, force and efficiency. In fact, this kind of binary division where men are associated with some positive qualities and women with negative appears in the work of many other feminist critics and is a dominant idea in feminist discourse. In her highly celebrated book, The Second Sex, which is now considered a feminist classic, French thinker Simone de Beauvoir, drawing upon Hegel's uh, distinction between the self and the other, discussed how women have always been defined as the other of men. In her exposition of this distinction, self is male, whereas the other is female. The other is associated with all negative traits which the self discards. Thus, if the self considers itself rational, the other is given the identity of irrational. All other binary divisions such as strong and weak, active and passive, aggression and docility can be explained on this basis. Shoshana's Fellman's words can be quoted here theoretically subordinated to the concept of masculine, masculinity, the woman is viewed by man as his opposite, that is to say, as his other, the negative of the positive and not in her own right. This arbitrary division of male and female characteristics creates problems for reading the texts written by men. Should women readers identify with the male point of view? so aggressively present in texts like those by Lawrence and Norman Miller? Should they try not to read differently? Why should they be forced to take pleasure in the sale of a wife and a baby daughter which fills them with outrage? Why should they be forced to read like a man? Why should they not read like women? These questions have been raised by most feminist critics. 
The title of Judith Fetele's work, The Resisting Reader, answers some of them. Influenced by Kate Millett's sexual politics, Judith Fetele's book is also a feminist intervention in reader response criticism. She exhorted the feminist readers to change the existing practice of reading. She considered feminist criticism a political act, the aim of which is not simply to interpret the world, but to change it by changing the consciousness of those who read. Fetele attempts to change the consciousness of the reader by refusing to accept what is there in the, in the work. The existing practice of accepting everything on trust must go. She exhorts the feminist critic to become a resisting reader rather than an assenting reader. And by this refusal to assent, to begin the process of exorcising the male mind that has been implanted in women readers. The intent of Fetele was nothing short of revolutionary as she announced her work to be a self-defense survival manual for the woman reader lost in the masculine wilderness of the American novel. Fetele pointed out that American writers have presented American experience from a purely male point of view. The idea of a life in an old male world free from the chains of domesticity the concept of male bonding, the restricting influence of women on men are all taken up in American stories and novels. She studied many celebrated stories such as Rip Van Winkle and A Rose for Emily and novels like A Farewell to Arms and The Great Gatsby to see the celebration of a male point of view. In all, Fetales was an important work to reveal male bias in American literature. Elaine Showalter identified two important aspects of feminist criticism. And now we are talking about women as writers. These were feminist critique and gynocritics. Feminist critique is concerned with works written by men and a critique of the representation of women in their works. In other words, women as readers. Mary Elman's critique of phallic criticism Kate Millett's attack on canonical male writers and Judith Fetele's advocacy for the resisting reader are obviously part of the feminist critique. Gynocritics, on the contrary, is concerned with women as the producer of textual meaning. In her famous essay, Feminist Criticism in the Wilderness, Showalter explained that gynocritics is concerned with women as writers the history, styles, themes, genres, and structures of writing by women, the psychodynamics of female creativity, the trajectory of the individual or collective female career, and the evolution and laws of a female literary tradition. A concern with gynocritics can be seen not only in Show Walter's work, but also in the work of a number of women critics. In her work, Literary Women, Ellen Moores concentrates on the interaction of women writers with each other and the literary relationships formed by them. By talking about a number of can canonic women writers' communication with each other, Moores emphasizes the presence of a female literary tradition. She discusses how there was a literary interaction between George Eliot and Harriet Beecher Stowe and between Emily Dickinson and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Moore also highlights the distinctive and unique in the work of each writer. The discovery of kinship between women writers, it is not often realized, had very deep implications. As Pam Morris says, finding their own emotions, circumstances, frustrations and desires shared named and shaped into literary form gave and continues to give many women, some for the first time, a sense that their own existence was meaningful, that their view of things was valid and intelligent, and their suffering was imposed and unnecessary, and a belief in women's collective rights to resist and remake their own lives. Writing by women can depict the aspects of women's lives 
that have been erased, ignored, demeaned, mystified, and even idealized in the majority of traditional texts. Eline Showalter also discussed a female literary tradition in English literature in her famous book, A Literature of Their Own. She considers women's literature in terms of a female subculture, which has its own themes, patterns, and motives. She viewed literary uh, periods from the perspective of women's writing and divided them into three different phases, namely feminine, feminist, and female. First, there is a prolonged phase of imitation of the prevailing modes of the dominant tradition and internalization of its standards of art and its views on social roles. Second, there is a phase of protest against these standards and values, an advocacy of minority rights and values, including a demand for autonomy. Finally, in the third phase, there is self-discovery, a turning inward, and a search for identity. However, critics of Show Walter point to the racial bias in her scheme. As Susie Tharu and K. Lalita write, although the period covered by Show Walter's book coincides with the age of high imperialism, neither Briti Britain's colonial possessions nor the complicity of English women writers, not excluded, in the ideologies of class and of empire are seriously dealt with. Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar also tried to highlight a female literary tradition and female literary creativity as women writers respond to male literary assertion and coercion. In the works of women writers like Jane Austen, Mary Shelley, the Brontes, George Eliot and Emily Dickinson, Gilbert and Gubar discover a hidden note of rage, revolt, and concealment in women's writing. In the work of a different nature, the mad woman in the attic, the woman writer in the 19th century literary imagination, Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar also try to highlight a female literary tradition and female literary activity as women writers responds to male literary assertion and coercion. In the face of male literary traditions, women writers experienced a sense of anxiety and confinement. Focusing on the work of women writers like Jane Austen, uh, Mary Shelley, the Brontes, George Eliot, and Emily Dickinson, Gubar, again, as I just mentioned, discovers the note of rage in their work. They pay special attention to Bertha Mason in Charlotte Bronte's, Bronte's Jane Eyre and consider her a typical example of this rage and concealment. They write, as we explore 19th century literature, we will find that this mad woman emerges over and over again from the mirrors women writers hold up both to their own natures and to their own visions of nature. Even the most apparently conservative and decorous women writers obsessively create fiercely independent characters who seek to destroy all patriarchal structures which both their authors and their authors' submissive heroines seem to accept as inevitable. Of course, by projecting their rebellious impulses not onto their heroines, but onto mad or monstrous women who are suitably punished in the course of the novel or poem, female authors dramatize their own self-division, their desire both to accept their, uh, to accept their structures the structures of patriarchy, patriarchal society, and to reject them. One very important line of inquiry in gynocritics is the discovery of lost women writers. The implicit assumption is that many women must have written in the past without getting their recognition for their efforts. And due to various reasons, 
many would not have been able to get their writings published. Therefore, the discovery of lost writers was taken up with a sense of urgency by a number of feminist critics and is an ongoing process. Hitherto unknown works have been unearthed and talented women writers who had been lost to the world had been brought to light. The idea of a female tradition of writing also informs the monumental study titled Women Writing in India 600 BC to the Present in two volumes, edited by Susie Tharu and K. Lalita. They have highlighted the works of a number of women writers who wrote in different Indian languages right from the ancient period to the present. Tharu and Lalita focus on writing cutting across genres and not necessarily literature, but such has been their influence that no anthology of Indian women writing can be attempted without acknowledging a debt to them. An important issue in gynocritics is the nature of female creativity. This question has been hotly debated both in a theoretical as well as an empirical manner. Do women write differently from men? Do they use language differently? Are there some words which women need to use more often? Is there really a style of writing which is essentially feminine or masculine? Is the literary imagination androgynous, partaking of both male and female characteristics? The answer to these questions has not been conclusive. Essentially, there are two different approaches adopted. The Anglo-American tradition uses the empirical method of analyzing the words used by men and women and tries to make some conclusions. For many of these critics, women's writing is marked by a kind of fluency. Others believe that women's writings should not be punctuated. Still others believe that women tend to relate to their subject and hence objectivity in writing is a male ideal. However, these issues are far from settled. In recent years, the scope of literary feminism has grown further the development and refinement of theories outside the Western world, a growing awareness about women's issues, the rapidly rising number of academics engaged in the study of feminism, and the establishment of feminist presses have all influenced the course of literary feminism. Thank you.